Hello, it's uh, Neil Dilworth again. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, the core neck tools. And uh, it's a very basic overview just to introduce uh, using the tool and uh, as well as uh, using a case to illustrate um, the uh, basic components of the tool. We'll talk about um, more specifics uh, about imaging later as well as uh, let me talk about the evidence based. Uh, evidence-based use of medications um, for uh, acute neck pain. So in terms of overview, um, background of why we, uh, we use and recommend using a, um, a core neck tool, um, take a look at essentially kind of a, a fairly um, a vast uh, differential for neck pain. And then we'll take a look at the case and then uh, We'll actually use the, the, the core neck tool. So the objective of this talk is to be able to use, uh, describe how to use the core neck tool and being aware of uh, red flags is a very, very important piece of this. Um, and to, to know that there's essentially some simple treatment options available as, uh, as part of the tool. So once again, why, why are we using a tool to assess these areas? So when we think about the basic anatomy, um, in terms of just from a bony perspective, uh, in itself, you've got your seven cervical vertebrae, um, but that becomes very complex as we add on the layers of anatomy, and there's a number of things that can both essentially refer to neck um, uh, as well as in the neck that can cause neck pain that are not musculoskeletal. And um, the, the neck tool is very helpful in terms of uh, elucidating both from a, a history as well as an examination what's coming uh, specifically from uh, the, the neck from a musculoskeletal perspective versus other things. So when we take a look at the differentials, um, it's part of a differential uh, list that was put together uh, for uh, the sports and education website, sportmedschool.com. And uh, if we just take a look at a basic category of uh, fractures, spinal cord, uh, cervical spine, non-fracture, non-spinal cord, uh, muscular tenderness, and some, some other conditions, you can see that there's a number of essentially uh, pathological, pathological conditions that can occur in the neck. Um, obviously, when we take a look at the first category, fractures, we're obviously most we're thinking about essentially um, these are things that will occur after a trauma or a mechanism injury that leads to an impaction or axial loading of the neck. Uh, and then we take a look at the spinal cord injury, some of these may be. Uh, related to, to trauma, so these may be related to uh, other conditions. Um, so it could be related to degenerative conditions um, uh, and sometimes congenital conditions as well. And when we take a look at the cervical spine, then we're getting into essentially more of the musculoskeletal uh, neck pain that is essentially um, will be assessed within the non uh, red flag uh, part of the core neck tool as well as the um, muscular tendinous apart from the referred. Um, and then when we take a look at the other, these are some things that can obviously um, be somewhat scary, such as, you know, a pharyngeal abscess or discitis, um, but the neck tool using the assessment part and assessing for red flags will help identify uh, these as lying outside uh, our essentially musculoskeletal neck pain that we're looking to treat and manage using the cornic tool. So we're gonna use a case to start. Uh, this is probably something that most people have seen in a primary care setting. A uh, 24 year old male uh, woke with neck pain three days ago. Doesn't recall any injury. Uh, he had Noel recently with no recent infections. He has no past medical or surgical history. Feels the pain with rotating uh, to the right. It's bothering quite a bit uh, over the course of the day and he works as an investment banker. He has um, been continuing to work in the interim. So the core tool basics, once again, the assessment. Um, similar to the back, we take a look at whether it is essentially neck dominant um, versus shoulder or arm dominant. And then we're taking a look at red flags and yellow flags. The examination, we want to know the provoking mechanisms, range of motion is very important. And the neurological examination is very important. And then uh, management, uh, we'll talk about exercises and activities to, to do or to, to avoid the medications. And like I said, the referrals and, and the, the imaging 
we're going to talk about um, in terms of a, a, a different um, portion of the, the modules. So the core neck tool has eight assessment questions which can be broken down as is there a headache present, yes or no? Uh, so there's a, a separate part of the tool for purposes of uh, what we're doing uh, tomorrow at the Sports Medicine Conference. We want to focus on the, the non-headache uh, related uh, cervical uh, spine pain. And uh, then we go on to the next question. So then is it neck uh, versus arm or shoulder dominant? And um, once again, some of the back pain, this can be sometimes hard for patients to Answer and you really want to pin them down as to what if you're to give them a, give them a magic pill that was going to take one away which would they take the pill for the neck or a pill for the arm or shoulder um, once they answer that question then you have your answer there and what we want to know the next question is whether or not the pain is intermittent or constant the intermittent pain elucidates that there's more mechanical feature to the pain uh, that you're getting into a certain position and then you're getting the symptoms as opposed to constant, which we more keeping with essentially uh, some kind of neural compression or irritation impingement. And then we get into the part of the assessments uh, in terms of the next four questions, uh, which will give us an answer as to is there something else going on apart from a musculoskeletal condition. So cardiac symptoms, which can be non-specific, so dizziness, obviously chest pain, feeling lightheaded, uh, those are not classic of a musculoskeletal specific pain, and they may warrant uh, essentially referral for some cardiac investigations. Neurological symptoms, those can obviously go along with essentially um, compression of uh, nerve components, but certain features would be, for example, having bilateral uh, symptoms, uh, motor weakness, quickly progressing symptoms, so it was fine yesterday, but now essentially I'm very weak, and now I can't feel any of my arm. Um, and then obviously uh, any kind of other uh, neurological symptoms distally, so difficulty with coordination um, or weakness in the legs, that's something of a concerning feature from a neurological history perspective. Obviously trauma history, like we talked about in the previous differential pay, um, slide, um, if there's a history of trauma, you, you want to essentially clear the cervical spine of any kind of fracture and, or instability before moving on. And the following one is then the inflammatory history question. So taking a look at those uh, patients less than 60, generally speaking, that are having any kind of morning stiffness or increasing um, pain at night that's waking them from sleep. Um, as well as any other kind of family history of uh, inflammatory symptoms. And then the following, the following question is about function in terms of if it's prohibiting them from doing any kind of activities um, and if it's significantly doing so, uh, that might lead you to essentially further asking about yellow flags. The red flags, uh, once again, these are things that will lie and take you outside the Cornet tool to do further investigations uh, or consider referrals. So progressive neurological symptoms, obviously motor weakness or a profound loss of sensation, um, specific, and specifically including you know, heat and temperature uh, loss of sensation. A history of trauma, okay, once again, that's a concern there is uh, any kind of fracture or instability in the spine as a result. History of fever are um, meningeal signs, and this will include essentially a history of IV drug use as well as immunosuppression. That's going to essentially uh, increase your risk of um, your index of suspicion for uh, infectious uh, pathologies of the spine, like abscesses or discitis or osteomyelitis, and then a history of cancer or B symptoms, um, obviously spinal tumors or bone nuts uh, would be concerned, and then finally a positive inflammatory history. This is a very important slide. Uh, what I want to indicate here is from a musculoskeletal cervical spine uh, that pain, so acute neck pain, it should not be referring to the front of the patient in terms of their chest or their front of their neck. Very few things from a musculoskeletal perspective um, will cause anterior neck pain. Um, the exceptions to that would be a, either a uh, clavicular fracture 
um, or a sternoclavicular um, uh, injury such as a subluxation or dislocation. Apart from that, the majority, uh, absolute majority, uh, if not all the rest of your musculoskeletal cervical cervical spine should refer posteriorly. So to the back of the shoulder, um, uh, in between the scapula and the spine, um, and then uh, potentially down the arm for, for radicular symptoms or arm dominant pain patterns. So once again, if you're sitting you know, there, patients uh, describing pain that's going into um, the chest, that's a concerning feature unless they have essentially an obvious sternocolicular or clavicular injury. On examination, I've divided it up in terms of the core neck tool into neck uh, examination and then the neurological perspective. So from a neck examination, you want to take a look at their posture. So are they forward, forward posture, forward flex, sh shoulders rolled forward? Um, are they holding their head up? Um, are they unable to move it so they're turning their body um, as opposed to their head when they're uh, turning to look to you? Assessing the lymph nodes uh, for any kind of inflammation or tenderness. Neck range of motion. Uh, a couple things from a neck range of motion perspective. Um, they do talk about lateral lateral flexion, okay. Um, typically that has limited utility, but the main ones are essentially rotation. So right rotation and left rotation. And then extension and flexion. Those can be further, div further divvied up into essentially upper cervical um, extension and flexion by essentially having them protrude their chin forward and then flexing upward and downward. By doing that, it locks into place. It locks into place their lower cervical spine. And you can also do essentially rotation in that position. So that head shaking position when your neck is and chin is protruded forward essentially helps isolate out C1, C2 range of motion. And then opposite is essentially retracting the chin back. Okay, And then turning right and left you'll notice that that range of motion, if you try that yourself, will be limited. That is essentially a, a lower cervical range of motion. Uh, and then a Sperling's test. So classic Sperling's is essentially a just a lateral tilt and compression. What we're typically talking about when we're talking about Sperling's is a modified Sperling's. This is a compression test of neural elements. And what we ask that you have the patient do is essentially rotate the head, tilt, then look up and then apply an axial load and see if they have symptoms down the same side. And then the other thing you should screen for is shoulder range of motion. It's often, especially in the middle-aged po middle population, 40 to 60 and above, um, they will have some co-committant rotator cuff pathologies um, that may be contributing, as well as a corbicular pathology that may be contributing to some of their pain syndrome. So making sure that that range of motion in the shoulder is maintained and that we're isolating out the, the problem coming from the cervical spine. From a neuro neurological perspective, we're taking a look at gait. Uh, this is to, to rule out any kind of more profound neurological deficits. Uh, sensory testing of the, the upper limbs, power testing of the upper limbs, including uh, testing the hands, so grip strength, uh, adduction of the fingers versus resistance, adduction of the fingers versus resistance, uh, upper motor, the neuron reflexes, so checking for a Hoffman's uh, test, and then um, both biceps and supinator reflexes. So management, what we do with this uh, young gentleman who has uh, essentially acute neck pain, we prescribe them rest, we get them into a soft collar, uh, prescribe them uh, medications. So the, the interesting thing uh, specifically about neck moves in the back, so for neck, the majority of acute neck pains will resolve within two months, regardless of treatment, regardless of recommendations. And I think that's a very important take home message. Now, obviously if a patient's coming to see you, that increases the likelihood uh, that they'll be wanting guidance, recommendations, um, and, and potentially medications. But I think that's something that you can let patients know that it could be reassuring for them. Um, we really, really want to limit the rest and immobilization period. So if somebody's in a lot of pain and uh, for a reason you're going to recommend a soft collar, um, it makes sure it's only for a very, very short period of time, a matter of days. Um, we kind of want them to return their activities as tolerated early. And once again, if we need to give them modifications for those activities, that's very, very 
uh, helpful and much more helpful than essentially prolonging uh, a period of rest and, and protection of the neck. Um, Medication-wise, basically, if you want to start off with some Tylenol or, or anti-inflammatories as needed. If there's associated nerve pain, I put this in bold and italics. It's not um, 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 not entirely within uh, the uh, uh, coronary tool, but it is mentioned. Uh, you want to consider essentially um, tricyclic anticonvulsants, uh, potentially an SRI such as venlafaxine or uh, duloxetine, and then short course corticosteroids are another potential treatment. Um, but uh, definitely the, the TCAs or the anticonvulsants is a, a nice addition, especially uh, if anybody is, ha if you're concerned about any kind of uh, risk of addiction with uh, opiates, um, and they tend to have a better effect than the opiates uh, for their particular symptoms. If they are low risk and they're in a severe amount of pain and you want to consider uh, short-term course opiates, that's a potential there as well. Do that uh, if you're going to do that. I would do that with the recommendation that they essentially you come up with a plan with the patient that they are going to do that in conjunction with returning to uh, essentially their activities as tolerated. And then, if you're going to recommend physiotherapy or treatments, that we're doing that with essentially the goal being active exercises, and active treatments for the patients doing uh, essentially uh, whether it's isometric strengthening and range of motion themselves as opposed to passive treatments. Um, which typically are not uh, effective and then it could also contribute to some chronicity. So in summary, um, using, uh, using this tool can assist in assessing patients with uh, neck pain. Um, be aware and, and screen for red flags at, uh, at both the initial and follow-up assessments. And once again, most of these cases will resolve within two months with or without treatment. Here's some of the refer references and uh, thank you very much. Look forward to see you tomorrow.